Hey everyone! Welcome back to Emerald City Hockey Post Game Live. I, that's it. I, that's all I can do. That's all I can muster. Uh, that's this is. Are we used to it yet? Are we at that point of it? Are we still surprised? I was still a little surprised. I keep thinking game to game, like the, it's got to end. The slump's got to end. They got to be able to score more than once. They got to be able to do something, and and then. No, they can't. It's just this. Eight games in a row now. They've lost after entering Homestead, where they were just a couple points out of a playoff spot. And uh, they, they've still only picked up two points since then in, in those eight games. It's brutal. It's really brutal right now. And I'm, I mean, there's, there's some serious questions now coming after this one, especially because you give up four goals in the first period to a bad team a really bad team in Montreal, right? Like they're not a good team. And I mean, you just, you just can't. And it's just, it's the same stuff every time and every game. And I just, I don't know what, what's left. I, I'll say this before I, I do the sponsor thing and get to the comments. I don't know that I would be surprised if I woke up tomorrow to hear that Hackstall was fired just because something has to change here and nothing can nothing seemingly changing and eight games is a long time especially when you were still in playoff contention uh at the beginning of that you dropped a bunch at home you dropped five at home you went on the road you lose both of those games and not particularly well and now you come back home and you kick off the second home stand like this with four goals in the first 20 minutes two goals on the first two shots against if the Kraken want to do something, if they're worried about salvaging uh, fans for next year, anybody season ticket holders, whatever. I do look at this with back-to-back -back games at home against a team like Anaheim, the overall situation. I don't know that I would be surprised if that news broke tomorrow morning. And uh, that's, I mean, we can, we can ask RJ about it later. I'd love to hear all your thoughts about it as well in the comment section, but um, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I don't, I don't know that it would really fix anything. I don't necessarily think that he should be let go right now, but that this kind of game and this kind of streak that the team is on and the fact that you're starting off another homestand like that leads me to think that maybe we could really see something happen here for the first time. We might have to see this organization become reactive to the situation instead of trying to be patient and just outlast it. And um, I don't know. We've talked about stuff like that before though, and they haven't. So it's entirely possible. I just, it just feels different. It just feels different now. It really does. Um, of course, going to start off by uh, thanking our wonderful sponsor, Flatstick Pub. Again, another reminder for that watch party I'm going to be doing there up there at their uh, South Lake Union location on Friday, April 5th for that game against Anaheim. <laughs> not, not one of the next two days games that we have against Anaheim, but the third game we have left against Anaheim on the schedule. Uh, going to be up there. Can't wait to watch that with everybody and, and, uh, and hang out with everyone there at flat stick at that awesome South Lake union location. So want to get that in and then we'll kick off with the super chat here from Schultz. The Habs are not a four goal better team. If the Kraken aren't already on vacation, lineup shuffling failed. Power play was torture. Sack the hack. Bless the Jess. I don't know that they would bring up Jess Campbell. That would be really something. Cause that is that, that becomes part of the question, right? Let's say you do make a coaching change somebody's got to be head coach. Dave Lowry's probably the guy, right? Like that would make the most sense. He has, he has head coaching experience and um, you know, he, he was kind of brought in to be more of like a, a senior advisor, a senior level advisor. Um, I feel like he would be the appropriate choice, but you know, if you wanted to help out a guy like Jay Leach or see what you have in a guy like Jay Leach, somebody who has, interviewed for head coaching jobs in the past couple off seasons, you could go with Jay Leach too and just kind of give him that, that shot, give him a, you know, 12 game audition. Um, that yeah, would, it would be an interesting situation there. And I'm with you Schultz. This team is not, this team's not four goals worse than Montreal. Montreal had five goals on 17 shots. Kraken had one goal on 37. I mean, that's where this team is at right now. And I know it's not just like the, the basic numbers game like that, but it's 
it's just everything. It, it, it's all compounded around stuff like that, around the fact that, you know, you don't play tight interior defense. So you allow guys to be there for deflections or to screen your goaltender or to walk in on your goaltender and have the time and space to know, hey, look, he's not going down for the shot. I bet I could pick him apart with the five hole or in in the breakaway opportunity. You're giving him enough time and space on that shorthanded breakaway um, from Matheson where he can just outweigh Joey. Joey eventually picks up his leg thinking he's going to go up high. So he sends it down low, right? Like these are, these are all situations where it's, you know, the defense in and around the interior is just so not there. It's not even like they're, they're playing bad. It's that they're not there at all. And um, I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't know how they can continue to be that way too. It's like, it's progressively getting worse somehow as well. Like we saw that be a problem for them in the Arizona game. And then it was even worse for this one. I don't know how that happens. I don't know how you continue to make these same basic structural mistakes game after game after game. There's no reason to do it. There's it, it just, I, it, again, it just reeks of everybody being checked out. And that's fine. I get it. You're done. Your season's over. It's been a long, grueling year. Guys have been injured. You're tired. You're hurt. You're banged up. Everybody's kind of over it. I get that. I think to some extent, we're all probably feeling that way too right now. But you still got to go out there and you still got to try. You still got to do your job. You still got to play for your spot on the roster next year. You still got to play for your uh, contract incentive. And most of all, you still got to play for the fans because the fans have still paid money to go and, and watch this team play. And, you know, if you are a season ticket holder, this game costs the same for you, you know, as every other game, right? It, it, it's not like they price late season games cheaper at the beginning of the year when you got to pay for your season ticket for the year. They don't price these later games cheaper thinking, oh, we're probably going to be out of it. and The team's not going to be playing up to snuff. It's not how it works. And so, I, again, those are the things that I think are the most concerning about this. It's not the fast, fact that they lost eight. It's not the fact that they can't seem to win at home. It's not even entirely the fact that they can't defend or score goals or do any of those things. It's the fact that they can't seem to put a game together, put a 60-minute effort together right now for the fans. And, and that's something like we've talked about is extremely new. This is a, an extremely new development, and to me, it's, it signals that this is enough of a new and disturbing in development that maybe some action needs to be taken here in some shape or form, right? Whether it is a coaching dismissal or it's something else, something has to happen because you can't just let this go on because what message are you sending to all of us? And what message are you sending to the fan base? And what, what message are you sending to the players in that locker room, the young players like a Maddie Beniers or a young player like a Shane Wright in Coachella Valley looking at the organization that he's hoping to join next year, right? At some point, the messaging has to be different. And and the first step in doing that is to make some sort of change. I don't, I don't know what it is or what it has to be, but something has to change. Uh, and actually, we're going to talk about a lot of that tomorrow on the deep dive. That's already kind of what we're doing is just what would we change about the Kraken? And it was going to be for next year, but maybe that that time frame has to be moved up. And it's what do we what would we change for the Kraken right now? Um, so we'll we'll be talking about that tomorrow in more in depth. Uh, light with a super chat here. I just don't see Hack surviving the offseason. I think the ownership is going to intervene if they haven't already told Ron to look for replacements. That's what I'm talking about. Like, I got to think people above Ron are taking notice of this and they're looking at the situation. They're going, this is, this is pretty unacceptable. I don't think we can really do this much longer. I think like, this is a problem uh, all the way down. This is a problem. And I, and I think, um, I think that's why we might see something. I think that's why we're, we're getting, uh, we're getting to the point where something has to happen and that that's on the table again. And I think it's on the table more in, in a, in a different way than when we were all talking about it back in December when they were on their previous big long losing streak because this is happening in a much worse way. Those those were rough losses and they were losing and yes they could sprinkle in some overtime losses but it was it was the players trying to figure it out. Everybody was trying to figure it out and there was still just this idea that at any given moment you could break out of it. And uh, 
that doesn't exist here, right? The effort level is not here. That was there in December. Uh, the players in the locker room are not speaking the same way that they were speaking back in December where they were taking ownership of it and saying they need to be playing better. Now they're just saying, I don't know. It's really different, right? What I got to experience in the locker room in Arizona was extremely different. It wasn't an upset locker room. It was a locker room that didn't really totally seem to care a bunch. There was some people walking off the ice after they lose in overtime after allowing the game tying goal with 40 seconds left on the clock. And they were walking back to the locker room and they were smiling and joking. I didn't talk about that on the Arizona one, but that's something that I because I didn't I didn't know that I, I should say that. But after after sitting with it and then after the game tonight, I think I have to mention it. Right, they did it right in front of me. They did it in front of other fans too. By the way, was it was pretty open, and I, and I just think that that speaks volumes about where the team is at, and that's why, like I said, something has to change. You can't exist as an organization like that. You can't let that become acceptable and let that become part of the culture. You cannot let losing in this way consistently and the lack of effort become normal and acceptable. It's just one of those things that that I've seen it take down so many great organizations. You just can't let it happen. And so that that's where I'm at. I, I think something's got to change for those reasons. Uh, hopping over into the comment section. I, it's big ball of sunshine today. I'm, I'm sorry if it's like too, if it's too rough for everybody, but um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I'll, I'll kind of burn through here and then I want to kind of get lower into the comment section to see how people are reacting to it and, and maybe adding their thoughts onto what I've been talking about. Um, I, I, I see your message there, Sam. I will translate it later because RJ is the one that, that speaks French, not me. Um, Julia, it was over in the first five minutes and then we just had to endure the rest, basically. I mean, that that is that is 100% true. That is just the, the place we're at. Ryan, is this the bleakest the future has ever looked for the franchise? It's the bleakest the present has ever looked for the franchise. Um, the future is as cloudy as ever, right? Uh, it's hard to see into the future. Um but as, as far as the present, this is the most depressed I've ever felt as a Kraken fan, as somebody covering the team, uh, just having to go through the motions, doing this job and, and doing this. This is by far and away the bleakest I've ever felt about the current situation that the team finds themselves in. And I got to think a lot of fans would would agree with that. Um, Sean, what do you even say after that? That looks like a completely checked out hockey team. I guess I like Ty's effort. Yeah, I mean, Ty is the most consistent guy on this team. He gives the exact same game every game. And it's a, it's a solid effort game with a little bit of skill thrown in and his ability to just kind of mesh with whoever he needs to mesh with. Like, that's a very valuable piece, especially in a time of year like this. Uh, but it is not enough, that is for sure. Um, the, unnecessary, the unnecessary injuries in this one, this is from Nicole. Really hope Garth is okay and whatever happened to Tolby and Canner at the end. I'm with you. It's just like it's adding insult to injury, right? The fact that those guys all go down in this game. If anybody is dealing with anything remotely serious at this point, just sit them. Don't don't have anybody push it. Same thing they're doing with Vince Dunn, right? Just shut them down for the year. There's no point. Um, Riker would be the only one you could make an argument for, in my opinion, just because he's young and and every game rep counts. But at the same time, uh, long-term future needs to be what, what everybody cares about at this point. Byron, did we ever figure out what happened to Riker? I didn't get any info on it. Uh, we can ask RJ, but traditionally, as we all know, we won't know anything until tomorrow if they practice. Like that would be that would realistically be what it is. Um Lindsay, boy, I sure did pick a good game to miss. My KHL team lost two tonight. Yay for tanking. Yes, if you're a fan of tanking, this was a game for you for sure. And so, Lindsay, it was it was a game for you. Uh, sorry about the the loss. I hope uh, I hope you still had a good game and had some fun. That's that's what's most important about it. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Uh, Kalen, I'd settle for the tank if a mentor guy stopped getting hurt, right? Like that's I'm I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I would I would definitely do I'm on board with that. Uh it's it seems like a fair trade-off there. Um, let's see. Well, we're competing with Montreal in the Celebrini sweepstakes, so I guess it's that's the bright side in all of this. Yeah. 
it, it puts us, you know, what seemed impossible to move ahead of the eighth spot in draft order. Each one of these losses somehow makes that a more and more possible future for the Kraken. Uh, so, I, yay, there's that. Uh, on Onslaught with the first fire hack, I knew we were going to see some of those. Um, been saying it for, for literal months, and it's been, oh, this isn't Hack's fault. Um, like I said, it's not entirely Hack's fault, but he is he is the guy that would be in the in this the spot for it. Uh, I think there's some element of this that is Hackstall's fault. There's there's been elements of things that over the three years he he hasn't necessarily done a great job with. Um, I still think roster construction is a problem. I still think uh, the leadership amongst the players is a is a is a problem. Uh, we've talked about all of this, so it's it's again it's. It's not all hacks fault, but I'm, I'm on board with you for the most part, like something's got to change and that would be an easy thing to change. And that would be a real kind of slap to the face to everybody in the locker room to get them to change. Right. And, and coaches are, are a lot easier to fire than front office people. They're a lot easier to fire than changing the roster and changing the players out. Um, that has been a normal part of, of sports. Everybody who coaches in any sport knows, you know, professionally knows that that is the situation. Um, and yeah, we're, we're at that kind of place now, I think. Um, thoughts on Barube? We don't want Barube. Greg Barube, no, 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 no. He is not the guy. Yes, he'll come in and maybe he'll get them to play more passionately, but this this is not a team of bruisers. This is not a team that's going to get into a playoff series and then want to go out and like try to intentionally injure people. Like we just don't have the the makeup of a team that Greg Berube would would work with, in my opinion. Craig Berube. Uh uh Ethan, here's my thought process. I might be way off. If we don't fire hack, this is all on purpose to tank. There's no way we keep him after this kind of streak. The, the only thing you would do is, again, if, if Ron Francis is is worried about his job security, you would keep Hackstall around so that next year, the moment anything goes bad, you can fire him and buy yourself time, right? Like that, that is the thing. And, and we've talked about this, uh, both me and RJ have talked about this, um, that, that, that would be the thought process. And, and if you, if you win like three of the next 12 games that you have left, right? I mean, it just seems impossible to keep him after something like that. It feels it feels more and more impossible to keep him after this. Um, and and yeah, if if it continues at all, if you lose to the Ducks, right? Like, I just I don't know how it how it keeps going. I just don't know how it keeps going. But if he hangs around, it is because one, the organization is extremely patient, and two, because he can be the fall guy later on. They don't feel like they need a fall guy right now, and he can be the fall guy later on. That would be the thought process, and that would be where my mind would go, um, just as somebody who has seen situations like this play out so many times in the past. Um, let's see. Alan, so McCann now possibly hurt. Tolvin in maybe two. Evans hurt. Dunn hurt. Still only scoring once, and Kraken fans' mental health declining with every loss. I'm so confused when we jump the shark. It happened fast, didn't it? It went from, oh, okay, I guess we're selling at the deadline. Wenberg's being held out for trade-related reasons. Oh, hey, look, we got a couple fun wins here. Okay, trade deadline comes, Wenberg's gone, homestand starts, and then it was just immediate, like, fall off a cliff, downhill, insanity. Uh, I'm with you. It is, it like, how quick it all happened is enough to give anybody anybody whiplash for sure like for sure um let's see uh each successive game is like the simpsons mean where bart says this is the worst day of my life and then homer says worst day of your life so far that is true <laughs> that is what kraken game days are starting to feel like oh i don't i don't like it i don't like it um Let's see. I'm now less worried that they're going to continually finish too well to draft potential impact players. Yeah, I'm 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 with you, Byron. I'm not feeling that either. Ricky, you must be thirsty, Dylan. It's OK if you sneak a sip of Gatorade. Firebirds got me. The Firebirds got me yesterday. I was able to watch a, a Firebirds win on my way back uh, from Arizona. I stopped in, checked out things in, in Coachella Valley. The Firebirds were able to get a win. And you bet I celebrated with two lemon lime Gatorades on the drive back from Palm Springs after that one because 
one, I'd been driving all day, both days, and I needed those electrolytes. And yes, I, 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 I needed it. I needed it. So the Firebirds, the Firebirds got me there, <laughs> got me. Oh, uh, but yes, it's, it's been rough. I, it's been really rough. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I don't think Hextall deserves to get fired, but if they're going to do it, wait until the off season. These losses are on the players. It's a good, you know, I could see something like that. Um, they should not mess with the Firebird staff. Yeah, they they won't mess with the Firebird staff. I would be shocked if they moved on. If they were to fire Hextall, I would be shocked if they did anything with the Firebird staff. Like I said, you've got Dave Lowry there. He's more than capable of helping you finish out the year. If you want to see what Jay Leach can do, you've got him already there too. Um, I, I think you let you let Coachella Valley cook and and you let them do what they need to do because they are right now the shining light uh, in the otherwise bleak darkness that is the the larger Kraken organization, right? I mean, we are everybody is so excited about what the Firebirds are able to do and the potential run that they're looking at again in only their second year of existence. You you can't mess with it. Just can't mess with it at all. Uh, if we get home, yes, yes, we are uh, we are very close to getting into all the all the draft stuff. Don't don't worry, everybody, uh, and all the prospects the Kraken could uh, could go after. Light with a with another um, uh, super chat here. Uh, I will push back on the past idea that Shane may not want to be here. Uh, looking at the loss, if I was him, I'd see this as my chance to shine. It'll be interesting to see who's dropping off. Uh, heading to uh, Abby, yeah. So, like I um. I, I know we talked about this. Um, I, I know we talked about this light on the Discord earlier. I, I want to talk about the Shane stuff a lot on the deep dive tomorrow, but I'll say this because you, you're so kind and, and gave the super chat. I'm very thankful for that. Um, I, I think I think Shane is just really dialed into the Firebirds, and I think Shane has sneakily become the leader of the Firebirds. That was the vibe that I was picking up yesterday, being there, watching him through warm-ups, watching how he operates on the bench. Shane, that is Shane Wright's team, at least in Shane Wright's mind it is, right? I'm, I'm sure some other people, maybe, you know, it's still Max McCormick is to, is the captain and, and Podorowski's an alternate and, and all the alternates and all that stuff. But watching the situation, it was clear that I was looking at um, a grown man in Shane Wright compared to what I've seen in the past, right? Where he still felt like a, a younger kid coming in. This was this was Shane Wright as somebody who was supremely confident, as somebody who felt in charge, and as somebody who um, I, I was just sitting there and I was I was really I don't want to say in awe of it, like it was just like this divine presence I was in. But he was. It was very. It was very impressive to watch Shane Wright yesterday with the Firebirds after having spent the full season there and going and playing in all of these good games and everything. And so I think the reason why I don't think Shane Wright would be looking at this and and necessarily wanting to jump all in on the Kraken or or try to get up into the lineup right now or anything like that or asking for a trade from the organization because I know that's what we had started talking about. Um, on the discord earlier today i don't think shane wright's there at all because i think shane wright is a thousand percent committed to the firebirds right now and he is going to do everything in his power to make sure that that organization and that, that fan base wins and he is he just seems so set up and dialed in on that it's it's really really something to see and it's it's not the stuff that you see like on the game broadcast or all that kind of stuff it's the stuff that you can kind of pick up in person or just watching how he does his business kind of in and around that building. Uh, Shane Wright is, is just, I mean, he is, it's something else. It really is. And I'm, I'm very happy for him that he has kind of found that place and that he is that comfortable and confident in himself. I think it's huge. I think it's huge. So I'm, I'm really, really, really liking what I see from Shane Wright. And I see you're further down super chat there. Boom. Someone else sees what I see with Shane there. I knew it. I, I was trying to hint at it. I didn't want to just straight out say it on discord earlier light. Uh, but yes, and we'll talk about uh, it more on the podcast tomorrow. Ethan, how do you watch those firebirds games by the way? Well, thank you, Ethan for the super chat. I was there in person. So I, I went and I, I covered the game as media uh, last night, um, but AHL TV, uh, if you go to the AHL's website, there's like a million ads and places that you can grab it. Uh, I, I was going to talk about this on the, on the podcast tomorrow, but when the AHL launches their playoff package, 
it'd be a, probably a good idea for a lot of people. This Firebirds team is really good. Uh, you can you can subscribe to the playoff package and get the get the full AHL playoff slate, and we can watch the Firebirds together. That would be a lot of fun. So those are the, that's how it is. And yeah, you know, if you're in the area or you can make the trip, I definitely recommend going down to Coachella Valley because it's a, an incredible atmosphere. Um, all right, so I think uh, I'm going to jump down in the comment section a little bit here, just because, like I said, we we talked about some big stuff going on there. Um, I, I just, uh, I, and I think that that's probably better is to kind of get into everybody's responses to some of it here. Um, let's see. Um, uh, the players playing soft all season seems like a telltale sign that they could pack it in, uh, from Kyle. Uh, 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 yes, they were soft, but I, I think I understood the reasons for it. And uh, I know, I know. Um, let's see. It's hard to believe this isn't purposeful at this point from Gabrielle. I know it's getting, it's getting really bad. It's getting really bad. Um, oh man, Dylan. I know I was trying not to be in my villain era still, but apparently I'm still here. Uh, let's see. I don't think Dave Haxtell is the answers here from Taylor. Um, Andrew. Yeah. Much love uh, for hacks, but something has to change at this point. Um, let's see. Uh, cannot stay like this. I agree. It can't. And we're dealing with the sermon. <laughs> Oh, okay, thanks. Um, Jenna, I don't disagree with Hack going, but I don't think any other coach could make this work. This roster is untenable. Yeah, I, I like again, I, I don't think this is all on Hack. I, I do think that a fair amount of this is just on construction. Like I, I talked about it last time, right? This is a team of value players. It's a team of pieces. It's a team of complementary pieces. And arguably some of the best, if not the best team of complementary pieces in the NHL. But that's not enough. And and that that is not on hack that falls on um, on Ron Francis. Right. Um, can you be cracking? It's looking more and more like last season was an aberration. It was. It, it, that's the way it feels. Right. I mean, we knew the shooting percentage was high, uh, but, you know, I, I, I thought this team was good enough to be a playoff team in a league where half of the teams make the playoffs. Right. Like that, that seems reasonable. Maybe not go on a run to game seven of the second round, you know, every year. But I, I really felt like this team was good enough to be in the top half of the NHL. And boy, was that thought wrong. I it just it's, it's still mind blowing to me. Lindsay, on a happy note, how about that Jagger Fergus Michigan lacrosse style goal? Pretty cool to have that skill in the arsenal. It is. Uh, it's it is always great um let's see uh Ferkus might be open to the highest bidder at this point i did talk about this um with curtis deep sea hockey who uh works with sound of hockey last night uh at the firebirds game jagger Ferkus's value has never been higher than it is you know going into this off season and i think just because of my thoughts on him kind of long term as a uh you know a, not not really having a solid nhl future uh you know laid out in front of him might might be something that the kraken should consider if, if i was them i would consider that um let's see uh addy so glad you're at the firebirds game last night their reliable performance is reassuring for the future it is i mean they were a team they had to tie it in the third and then they won it in regulation right like it late you know they go up i mean they the firebirds are just the exact opposite of the kraken right now like like they are just the exact opposite of the kraken where it's just like you, you that team could be be entering the final five minutes down five one and you know what there would be a part of you going like they, could, they might be able to do this right like whereas with the kraken you're just like is it over yet like you know what i mean like it's just it's 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 the opposite they're so so the opposite of each other right now uh taylor what's your opinion on todd mcclellan he's a decent coach with an offensive mind but lack depth in hiring him as the next head coach is not ideal um i'm not a huge todd mcclellan fan rj would hate that rj's been on the record for hating that um, I, I think Todd McClellan is a good regular season coach. He's a good coach for, you know, getting basic structures going, but just watching how the Kings locker room really fell apart under him this year is concerning. The same situation happened in Edmonton when he was last there. Um, you know, he, he had that long run with the sharks, uh, where they were never able to get over the hump. And I think a lot of that was in part because of him. Um, so I, I know he would be a good name and the team would be better under him, but I don't know, you know, as a, as a potential long-term guy with a younger team, 
that's going to have to also kind of go through a rebuild. I don't know how much interest he'd have in the Kraken job. And I don't know that he would just be the right fit for us. Uh, I just don't think he would be the right fit for us. I think, I think we need a coach that is, um, is going to be maybe a little bit tougher than he is. And also, you know, really kind of put in some structure and some systems. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about this a lot more in depth on the deep dive. I have to still get to so many comments uh, here, but I think the Kraken really need like a, uh, you know, obviously just to throw out like the best coaches in the business, a Bruce Cassidy, Jim Montgomery, um, you know, uh, what was the, what was the other guy I was thinking of yesterday, but, but they're all just examples of, of guys that run systems that they, that their teams really build off of and that can develop and grow year over year because that's what the Kraken have missed. And and that's, I think, another reason why maybe we see something. Got RJ here joining us. RJ, what was the reaction after that one? Because I shared something that I hadn't shared before about the Arizona game, and I'm, and I'm just kind of wondering what the energy and everything was like in the, in the room there. Well, now I'm curious what that is uh, that you share about the Arizona game. But uh, I'll, I'll start with what the energy was like after this game, because, oh, boy, do I have something for you, Dylan. Okay. Um, I saw a side of Dave Haxtell that I have not seen before in my almost three years covering this team. Dave Haxtell has had enough. And okay. I, I even pulled up on my laptop because I didn't want to, I didn't want to get the quotes wrong and everything. And I wanted to hit all the different points that he talked about, but uh, he basically, you know, he said, it's simple what this comes down to. He said, it comes down to, we've got to make a really hard choice in here. And then he, of course he was asked, what is that choice? He said, it's obvious what that choice is. I just talked about it, what this game is about, and it hasn't changed for many, many years, and it's not going to change going forward. You play this game with passion, you play it with heart, you play it for the guys next to you, and we are not doing that right now. And that is more than disappointing. And that's hard to be a part of, and it's, it's something we have to change. So he started with that. I mean, basically, he threw down the gauntlet to his team tonight. He said, this is unacceptable. The, you know, basically everything that we have, been saying yeah. we've been seeing right that they're not trying at this point they are not playing to the level that they can and they're getting flat out embarrassed at home multiple times and i think hackstall's drawn the line here uh and and i'm glad that he has because i think it needed to be done i think he knows it needed to be mm -hmm. done um i'm pulling up the other you know the other quote here he said just this this we got to figure out what we want to do because this stinks tonight this stinks we're walking out of this rink for a second time in two home games feeling this way. And it's unacceptable. You know, and, and the next question was about, you know, getting 37 shots on goal. And, you know, you're getting shots. It, it's not about that. You know, that's an easy way out of this one. Absolutely. I can go through, find all the positives yeah. you want. I can go through each and every one. But it's not about that. I'm not going to duck any of that. Um, and so, you know, the, the final question, too, was about, you know, because the press is the media, we're a conduit to the fans between the coaching staff and the fans. Yep. You know, do you have a message for the fans why they should continue to show up and come to these games? And he said, well, that's what we got to decide in here. You know, that's the decision they have to make in this room is if they're going to play worth the fans watching. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was reassured to see that Haxtell understands the gravity of the situation because this is just embarrassing at this point. Yeah. I mean, my first reaction is why did it take so long? Right. Like that's my immediate reaction. The se My second reaction, RJ, is do you think that that saves his job? Because tonight is the first night where I've really been like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow to the news that he has been let go because you can't start another homestand like this. Right. But now I'm wondering, is that enough? Is that him putting it enough on the guys in the room and being maybe on board with with Ron on something like that, that maybe that saves his job? I think so, because uh, I think you at least have to give the guys a chance to respond to that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, you have to give them at least one game to go out there at home and try and turn it around. I mean, we're going to find out in a couple of days how much these players want to play for their coach and how much they want Haxtell to continue to be the coach. He's done everything he can do and put it on the guys. They have to go out there and work. It's just that simple. Especially against a team like Anaheim, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like... There, there's no excuses if you can't beat Anaheim and have a good-looking showing against them. There, there's nothing else. I don't know. I, that's kind of where yeah. we're at. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was the what was the reaction from the players? Um, well, we got Jordan Eberle first, and it was just by volume the quiet, quietest post-game media availability I think I've ever heard. I only caught half of what he said, to be honest. It was just, and it was a lot of the same stuff. 
I felt like there weren't really any answers from him. We got Alexiak. I think it lasted two or three questions. And he said, you know, basically just we need to focus on the fundamentals and just get back to basics and play our game and all that stuff. Nothing out of either of those two that I, I really felt was takeaway worthy, honestly. You know, the, the guys know everything that's going wrong. And it just felt like the same thing as the last few games, right, where they're just searching for answers. But the real big difference was in Haxtell's tone. And it was a tone I've never heard from him before. Yeah. So the thing that I was alluding to that I didn't bring up in Arizona because I, I didn't know that I should. But after tonight, I felt like I should was that, you know, in Arizona, they come back from the uh, from the bench and then they have like a long walk out to the visitor's locker room because it's not in the building. Right. And right. that walk is is fairly public. And during that walk after that game, after losing in overtime, after allowing the game time goal, there was some guys who were disappointed and some that were smiling and laughing. And that it like I like it was just like how right like how after that a game like that I get it your yeah. season's over right you've turned to the page you're on to vacation time but like how right it's still your job like this is your profession you're being paid to do this and the reason you're able to be paid is because all of these fans are giving up their hard-earned dollars to make it happen right and and i just that's why i was really curious to know being back home if that tone was different right from the players if if it wasn't as much and it sounds like they probably heard it from from coach Axtall. they probably heard it through the two intermissions a lot uh yeah. if Axtall was willing to go that that way um it's just i mean it was just it's bad it's this is easily the worst it's ever been yeah and, and but we're finally at the point where at least Axtall is acknowledging that and, you know, the gauntlet has been placed down, right? We're going to find out a lot in the next couple of days about this team and, and where they're headed and who they want to play for. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, and it's just like, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm conflicted because I'm really happy to hear Hackstall do that and fi like yeah. kind of finally get on board with that and finally be the tough guy. But I'm also just wondering, like, is it, too little too late i mean at some point yeah okay you're gonna win the next game against anaheim that you probably should have won anyway like i don't know what it's gonna really mean right but i i also think about after these last two games right vegas and arizona the back-to-backs and i i watched the media availabilities with Haxtell for both and he defended the team's effort you know, he he said the effort was good it was where it needed to be when which kind of turned my head certainly right but yeah. he he put his neck out on the line for his players right he always mm -hmm. does this. And, you know, that's something that that's a good players coach. If you can get the effort back from the guys, right. You know, we yeah. had a subpar game. We threw it away, but the coach is standing up for us here, not throwing us under the bus. Let's go out there and reward him the next game with a really great effort. And the guys just didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Sean with the, with the super chat, who would you like to see them go with long term at coach Dylan? Uh, he answered, I, yeah, I mean, we're good. We'll talk about it more on the deep dive because that's part of like what I had planned there. Like, I, like I said, mm -hmm. I, long term, RJ. This is the thing, right? And and I, I'll just say it here because it's a super chat. Um, <laughs> so many teams around this league, right? We know what systems those teams run, right? And how and yep. what what the team is built to do. We know what Vegas is built to do. We know what Boston's built to do. We know under Tocket, that was the other guy I couldn't think of earlier. Everybody in Vancouver what that team's going to do game in game out, how they're going to play, how they have all the different, um, you know, like I, I'm blanking on the hockey equivalent, but basically route trees, right. Situations where depending on how many guys we're entering the zone with, depending on where they are and how many guys are defending, we're going to do this versus that, right? Like they, everybody knows it and the players know it all inside and out so that they can all be on the same page, regardless of who's playing with who. And it's one of those things that you establish your first year as a coach, and then every year you're able to build on top of it, right? And that's why you generally see from coaches a progression. Not everybody is Pete DeBoer where you have your best season right out of the gate, and then it's all downhill from there. Most coaches, you build up, and then by year three or four, the team is so locked in to what that system is, and you've been able to advance that system to the you know, by building on top of it year after year with so much time that you get teams dialed in and able to take that next step and go on and be cup contenders. And we're in year three of Dave Haxtall. 
And I could, st I still can't tell you what the system is. I can't tell you that they've had a system last more than 25 games at any point over three years. Right. So I don't ne have a necessarily a specific name in mind, Sean, but I want a coach who's going to do that because I think that that is the way that it should work. Right. You have the players buy into the coach's system and then that coach's system develops year over year as they have the time to slowly advance it. That has not happened here with the Kraken at all. Right. I mean, we're seeing it on opposing benches, right? When these opponents that come in Nashville. here and play against the crack. Nashville, super engaged. They have a system, you know, exactly what they want to do. And just th that's why I posted that video about the two benches, too. Just the contrast is just so stark. I, I want a bench and a coach who's going to do something like that. There, yeah. there are plenty out there that, that will and that can. Um, but just give me that at least. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Um, po went, you know, jump down. Um, let's see. Uh, jump it down just to get reactions to everybody for the mm -hmm. for the Hackstall stuff here, right? Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, it's been it's been embarrassing for Sean Brooke. Hack sounds like a disappointed dad. Maddie Hackstall reaction sounds like his seat's getting hot. Lindsay Hackstall kicking the trash can. Letter Kenny coach style. Effing embarrassing. Uh, Sean may be late for him, sadly. I really still do not think he's the problem. Coop sounds like Hack's last stand for once. It's not, we're right there. It's it's not that bad. That's a good way of putting it. Like, this does feel like his last stand. It does. I, like I said, I've never seen this side of him before, uh, even when things have been very bad. And over the last three years, there have been times where it's been very bad, including the long losing streak earlier this year. He, he's never been like this. Uh, and it was clear from the opening question or two which way he wanted to go with this presser and the message he was trying to send. Yeah, Riley, everyone on the team playing like the worst versions of themselves and Coop. It'll be very I'm very curious to see uh, if anybody reacts and plays differently. I'm going to be curious. I think there's a good chance they're going to respond and they'll they'll beat up on a on a tanking Ducks team next game. Right. Like, I think I think that that is something that we could see happen. Might maybe that carries over into the second game against the Ducks too, even. Yeah, it might. Got, I mean, you got twelve games though. Like, I don't know that that's going to really be enough to turn it around, and you're even going to be five hundred over the last stretch here. Right, that's the thing. I mean, you can have a really good effort next game, and you can come out and look great. But with this many games left, that message has to have some staying power. You know, yeah, we we may, like I said, we'll find out a lot in a couple days about where the guys are at and who they want to play for. But, you know, the real answer might be something we do learn over 12 games. But either way, we're going to find out. Yeah. Uh, Riley, it's so clear Hack has lost the room. Imagine This is a super chat, by the way. Imagine mm -hmm. if this effort was being given from the Flyers. Guys need to be reminded they're replaceable. And I think that that's, that's part of what I was, I was getting at earlier, and I didn't quite fully get there um, before you joined, RJ, which was that something needs to happen here, right? And obviously coaching coaching changes are the easiest thing to happen, but you can't as an organization, let this continue. You can't let this become the culture of, well, the moment we're out, we just all give up and that's fine. Right. Fans cannot accept that from the team and you can't accept that internally either. I think whether they move on from hack stall or not, because I I'm, I'm with you. I think this probably buys them some time now, it probably buys yeah. them the rest of the year and then they can reevaluate so. and you, you see how it all finishes. Big player trade this offseason, though, just to shake something up, just to send the message if you don't fire the coach? Because I think you have to do one or one of the two has to happen after what we've seen. Yes, definitely. And, and certainly before these last few games, I would lean way more on the side of big player trade because I thought that kind of thing had to happen anyway, just to free up somebody. Because as we've discussed, very few people are available. You got to give to get. But um, yeah, there, there's going to be a major change in the offseason. There has to be something after the bad taste that this stretch has put in every home fan's mouth, right? Uh, to yeah. get them excited about next year. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, let's see. Jeffrey just got home from the game. What are our best guesses as to why pretty much every single player is playing their worst this year? Uh, Cause they're, they're tired. They're beat up. It's been a long season and they know they're not playing for the playoffs. So the yeah, fire right now that's the there. case. Yeah, that's it. Sean, this is a very passionate fan base, and frankly, we de deserve much better all the way around from this organization. On Onslaught, too little, too late from Hack. Coop, the bar being beat Anaheim is now set at an all-time low. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I think this is the lowest the bar has been, at least in short-term expectations. Yeah, yes. 
Uh, I'm not going to name the players, everybody. I'm not going to do that. That that would yeah, be a no, step don't too do far. That. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, uh, I will say this, though. They, they did it in front of the fans. Like, it was part of the section where the fans can watch them walk out. Uh, so if anybody was there in Arizona, you saw it. Um, let's see. Uh, what does uh, – uh, uh, finally, come on! He's done it before. He just doesn't emote to the press. I mean, that that is fair, right? From from Crack and Spectacor here, you got to think Dave Haxtell's been like this and said these things to the team in the past, like back in December. I'm sure that had to have happened. Oh, right? I'm I'm sure he has. Yeah, and that's just different, right? Where, like you said, the tone toward the press. This is he never done that with us to us uh, sending that message in that way. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing was what I thought was weird is it before the Arizona game and the presser beforehand, he was asked about, you know, Bjorkstrand had his lowest time on ice uh, in the Vegas game. We talked about that during the Vegas game and he just straight up said, yeah, we, we need to see a little bit more from him. And I was like, of all the guys this year that's, that's the guy, the guy? you're gonna yeah, signal okay. out and you're gonna say you need to see more of from him and i was just more so shocked that he actually said something like that so i guess it was a precursor to this but like that that was another kind of weird thing about it and kind of where he's at but he did it in a very just like eh, you know just need to see more from him he'll be fine he's in a different spot tonight like kind of thing like it yeah. was just very odd um but i think him kind of getting to the point where yes he's starting to it showed that he was getting to the point where he was going to feel comfortable enough to do something like this tonight where he could say to you all in the media circle this team's not doing it these guys aren't doing it they're not performing they're not executing they're not pulling their weight and enough's enough yeah definitely i and i i really wonder too what the lineup's going to look like you mentioned the bjorkstrand thing what, what is the lineup going to look like for this ducks game we know one thing it's not going to be the same as it was tonight <laughs> no but it's it hasn't been the same for how many games in a row now yeah the line blender's been in full effect for a while now so right which i i don't know like are you are you just expecting to magically hit upon something like and just whatever whichever game the guys just happen to to pull out of it and and you play good or you happen to get a win or you just run into an anaheim ducks team that's terrible uh and that's just your lineup like Again, it's it's unsustainable doing this for any sort of long term thinking because it's not like anybody's building a rapport with anyone else when every game you're you've got different guys on all these different lines. Yeah, and like we talked about in the podcast last week, I don't mind trying certain things out like Tolvin and with Maddie just to see if there's anything there. You don't know till you try it. But just the issues with this team are so much deeper than that right now. You can't find out if there's chemistry. You can't expect chemistry to click anywhere if the effort isn't there at a fundamental level. And I think that's what the issue is. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's possible. Um, the team system is work hard. It doesn't work. <laughs> it certainly doesn't work right now. That is for, sh that is for sure. Um, let's see. Fuzzbox BBQ relentlessly celebrating positives in a loss creates a safe environment where mediocrity is tolerated. Um, I mean, I agree with that as like a concept and I do feel like a, a lot of that, happened earlier in the year to an extent too right and and i'll throw us in there too right we didn't want to make it too negative um either but you know in hindsight eh. right i mean i think the instinct you know whether it's from us or from hackstall is to give the guys the benefit of the doubt and give them the chance to go out there and and correct the mistakes uh but mm -hmm. when things do pile on and add you know at a certain point you do have to turn i think you know in this losing streak we certainly turned on it faster than hackstall did but at yeah. a certain point, you just have to. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, let's see. Um, Hack hasn't sat anyone. If they don't perform, it's okay. He has tools to combat this and just doesn't. I think that's another thing that I, I feel like a lot of fans have said about Hackstall in the past. And it is another one where it's like, yes, it's, it's almost weird that he went 0 to 60 from, from the Arizona game where it was like, you know, we'll we'll pull out of that to tonight where it's just like that's it i'm done right like right. it is weird that he there was none of those normal steps in between where he tried to get guys going before hitting the big red button that's i'm throwing you under the bus to the press so to speak right i i, I do think there's just something about the way this game played out going down for nothing in the first period where if you were in the building it it just kind of had a different level of this is pathetic i think 
than than what maybe came across on the broadcast. I'm sure plenty of that did come across if you're watching it on TV, but just mm-hmm. being in the building for it, I, I feel like it had had a big effect. And especially with the fans booing at the end of the first period and at the end of the second and the third, it just seemed like everyone was done. You know, they, so many people had left the arena, and I don't blame them the way that this went. Um, mm-hmm. That that I think Hackstall just again from being in this building and seeing everything that was going on around him it just had a different yeah. effect than games where you're maybe you're on the road. And so it doesn't have the same type of thing. Yep, definitely. Um, Coop, I'm really trying to think back. And the only time we saw hack really react outwardly was that time he dropped an F bomb and yelled at a practice, right? Yeah. And that was earlier this season, you know, the shoot the bleep and puck practice that famous one. And so he has pressed some of those buttons to the team before. Although, and I do think we, as the media were bent to hear that, at that practice you know he's very aware of those things yeah and and so you know he has done things like that but i I think this was a a different type of uh, a button that he pressed tonight yeah um let's say let's see if he says it and uh it's nothing to their game their game doesn't change then he's lost the room um Let's see. Their conditioning from top to bottom needs to be reviewed in the off season from Chris. Uh, I don't know. Do you think it's a conditioning thing? I don't know that it's a conditioning thing. No, I don't think it is. I think it's, I an, think effort it's an effort thing. thing. Yeah. yeah, I think it's an effort thing. Um, that's that's certainly where I'm at. Anyway, um, the power play, RJ, because they had chances tonight. It was bad. Yeah, I it, it was. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, and I know losing Riker at the beginning of the game certainly doesn't help that, and and not having done still doesn't help that. But it was it was again like those are the chances where you can at least make it not embarrassing, where you can do something for the fans, right? The game is probably over at that point, right? The game is over at the end of the first period for the most part. Although there are plenty of teams that wouldn't think that way, right? I refuse to believe that Nathan McKinnon could ever enter a second period down for nothing, and he would think that oh, we're well, I guess we just aren't going to do it tonight, right? Well, I mean, look at today. The Avs literally came back from four nothing <laughs> today to that win again true. that is true so uh so uh, yeah that's probably why i was th- I, he's the name that popped into my head um where, what was the i power gonna play. say Should, the power yeah, play the power i play. can i can jump in here oh yeah. well, go ahead no i was just gonna say like the power play is the time where you can at least send the message to the fans of like hey look we're trying and and we're going for it and they just didn't right i mean and they did almost score a power play goal in this one that got taken away as maddie veneer's put himself offside at the entry. And I don't think anyone really knew at that time, but it seemed like after that, they just let that kind of crush them. And there was all the the drive they had. Cause if that goes in, it's a game. They're down by yeah. two. It's a game. It's that, it's that kind of throw your hands up. Well, we tried and they wouldn't yeah. let us. <laughs> but, and I will say too, though, I, missing Dunn and Evans really hurts. I, I'm kind of tired of watching Justin Schultz quarterback power plays at this point. And then, I want to credit Haxel because I think this is a good thing in general. They went five forwards on the second unit when they didn't have another guy to quarterback it. And they had the worst case scenario where it just ends up being Tatar back and he just gets walked. Um, but like, I, I don't mind the decision, the personnel decision yes. there. No, I'm with still. you. I'm with you. I don't mind that. I wouldn't mind if you if you had four forwards and one defenseman, but the one defenseman was, say, Jamie Alexiak net front, right? Like, I, I think yeah. there's ways around it. Um I, I don't know why but that's just on the players Especially... though. Cause again, McCann throws a, a blind pass to the middle. It yeah. clearly gets intercepted, sends Matheson off to the races. Like, you know, that, also, that's not a coaching thing. The like... guy up high. So he's the guy who can be going back. Like he's, he doesn't strike me as the guy I'd want there. I don't know. I mean, it's just, I feel like it's as good a choice as any, he's got decent vision. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not going to criticize yeah. that little bit I, of it, but I, I will say this though, Maddie, right. The talking about the goal that didn't end up counting, Maddie net front, right? I talked about it after that Arizona game. I really think they are onto something there. Like that is the one dim light in all of the dark clouds is I really think that is the spot for Maddie Beneers moving forward, not just the rest of this year, but in future seasons, Maddie Beneers needs to be net front on the power play. Yeah. And he's just looking more and more natural there too. And if he can really work on tipping and deflecting the puck, I mean, you know, that'll be fantastic that he can add that to his game because he's good at kind of getting lost in those spots, right? He's not a bigger Mm -hmm. player. He's not going to box out in battle. But if he can just go to those areas and kind of get lost like some of the best tippers do, he could be really dangerous. Yes. Um, 
Uh, let's see, Riley. We don't need to be Vegas risky, but some of that outlook this off season would be nice. I, I really, like I said, I think that's got to happen at this point. It has to. Francis can't just go with his normal mo and you know make it one or two minor moves. It's just not going to work. Or you know maybe in the long long term it's a good strategy, but he won't be around to see the result. Yes, uh, Chris Hack is just throwing darts, and he's no Ted Lasso. <laughs> that is a good one. Uh, Maddie, I'm all for chaos, fire, hack, stall, trade away, Tanev, do literally anything. Uh, and then Lindsay, RJ, did you bring seawater? Can you break into the locker room and splash it on the hat? Oh, I did not bring seawater. I didn't have time. With the earlier game, an hour earlier, it just threw me off, and I didn't have time to go get the seawater. Uh, yep. But the people, actually, I did mention that to a couple people around here, and, and the idea was received well, I think. So we'll see if I can make that. Or maybe not splash it into the locker room, but as far as the seawater <laughs> cleanse. Yes, it might be might be worth it. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, Sam, not doubting Maddie at all. I'm just wondering uh, if they're done with specifically pairing Beneers and Ebbs together because we did see them break up for a little bit of this game. Yeah, we did. I, I mean, why not at this point? I, I know you, the consistency and the line blender and, and the results haven't been that great, but honestly, why not right now? Well, I, that's the one that I'm okay with because that's the one that you've been like the most stubborn about keeping together, right? Like that, that should have been the one place to start slowly making a change really. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do think I, I earlier, I thought I would have seen it sooner, right. If they were going to make that change. But I think in this game, again, knowing how Haxtell reacted afterward, knowing what must've been going through his head in this one, all mm -hmm. bets are off. We might yeah. see them back together next game, but the rest of this one, anything, you know, could have gone. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, a couple of questions here. Um, I don't think Maddie has a, a captain in him. He's so immature in a way that's not going anywhere anytime soon. That's from Jenna. And then from Taylor, is it safe to say Beneers should be a team captain from Taylor? It's tough because they have so many established leaders in that room. I've said it before. I wonder if he's just not comfortable as a young guy stepping in front of those guys. And we'll talk about this. I've already talked some about Shane Wright earlier, RJ, and his leadership that he's showing off in Coachella Valley. I'll, we'll get more into that tomorrow on the deep dive. Um, I do wonder just anybody kind of going through a situation like this, what it means. Right. I mean, look, I don't think he's grabbed the leadership, the reins leadership wise, but I think it's because there are those older vets in the room that he doesn't want to step on their toes. So we don't really know what it looks like when he tries to be the leader of a team because he just hasn't tried stepping in that role. Not to say that he's not capable of it, but, um, you know, he very well could be capable of it. It's just, you know, at a certain point, he has to be kind of given license to do that. And I yeah. don't think he really has yet. Yeah, and Nicole's Beneers can't be a captain without there being an actual captain for him to learn from first. Right. And that kind of speaks oh. to the larger leadership stuff involved. I think it's true. Right. Nobody has taken that locker room kind of by the reins and been the guy. Why? Why would we expect Maddie to to be the guy to do that without an example in his young career? That's um, a worryingly good point. Yeah, it is. It is, Nicole. Like you're really onto something there. Um, JMG, the softness of this team is getting players hurt. There's no fear of retaliation for opposing teams. We saw a lot of guys go down, including Tolvanen and Jared McCann late there, RJ. I, I know better than to ask if there's an update on any of them, including Riker. Um, but just the idea of like, it's just it's just that extra little bit that doesn't need to be there. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And look, in a night where the effort just wasn't on in any area, I'm not surprised that that was the case. No, no update on anybody, of course. Uh, but, you know, of course, it is concerning Riker with that lower body injury. We'll see how long he's out for. Yeah. Coop, as much as I give you guys crap, we all need you to be positive until it's untenable. I know y'all helped me specifically. I don't blame you one bit for trying to stay positive early on. <laughs> well, appreciate that, Coop, because it was rough earlier this season. But yeah, uh, glad glad to hear that it helps. Got another super chat here from DJ and Tay. Only thing I've learned from this convo is it's probably a good idea to catch the next deep time. I know. Have I said it enough, everybody? Have I pumped tomorrow's podcast enough? Yep. So tomorrow morning, I, I'm looking forward to recording that one. Yes, it is definitely going to be something for sure. I mean, chat is still just going off. We're at the hour mark and, and everybody's still just pouring things in here. Ricky, can we see a few other 20 year olds before determining Maddie has no leadership ability? Youngest guy on the team shouldn't be expected to carry the load. And, I, and I'm on board with that, too. Right. Like, I, I think that's 
basically what we were talking about as well. Uh, and Sam, Maddie could definitely grow into a leader in the future, not writing him off yet. Um, but yeah, it's it, it is one of those. I thought he was a little bit further along than he, than I guess he was after you know going through the the ten games that we saw from him first season and going into that second season after watching him at Dev Camp where he did take charge, right? Like guys, that is the one example we do have from him where he was in any sort of leadership capacity was that Dev Camp um, right after the Shane Wright draft where he was easily the guy and he ran that thing. I mean, he was running drills. He was stopping drills and then changing the drills from the coaching staff, right? Like he was the man. And I saw that and I said, oh my gosh, he's going to be the, the future captain of this team, right? If he feels comfortable enough to take charge of a situation like that, there we go. And I think then that really shows us the fact that he's not doing that here means that he's just trying to respect an established hierarchy. And maybe he shouldn't, right? I like yeah. I we've seen we've seen other guys in the past, RJ, come in and just be like, look, no, like this is bad let's let's do this why aren't we doing things this way why aren't we playing like this where is the the passion i hate losing and i'm not gonna let you guys make me a loser right that would be the nathan mckinnon thing to do right i was just like, thinking nathan mckinnon as you were saying that yeah <laughs> right but we've seen other guys do that throughout their careers and we've seen other young captains exist in this league and we've seen them succeed in this league as young captains before and i i do wonder if there's something to that yeah, definitely. I, I think at a certain point, you know, a certain type of, of leader is going to do that. And I think it's kind of thing that really needs to be done in this room. I, I feel like it's almost uh, unfair to put that on Maddie right now. I feel like he is too young to have all that placed on his shoulders. Uh, but I, I feel like that's the only type of thing that might turn this thing around. Yeah. Yeah. A um, little bit of a, a change of pace here. Fun one from Christopher. Hey, did you guys catch the second intermission tug of war? Yeah, that was my son and I. I was the little guy who got killed. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yes, I did catch that. It was it was a pretty big mismatch, I will say. Uh, there there were some because the last few have been mismatches by quite a bit. So like we need different weight classes for this uh, just because it did look a bit unfair. But that's awesome. You got to do that with your son. Very entertaining for all of us in the press bridge. I could say that much. <laughs> oh, that does sound good. And, and glad. I hope you had a good time regardless, Christopher. <laughs> it's, it's still got to be a special <laughs> moment for, for you and your son. Um, on onslaught, this is why the Ebbs contract makes me question everything. That five million and space on the roster leaves more options open. You know, like having those not there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean that is still part of it, right? Like you look at the just the overall message being sent from that whole thing. That it did not age well. That's what I said as soon as the contract, actually even before the contract was signed. This is what I was worried about on the armchair GM stream. Yeah, uh, you know, I've been saying it. Yeah, and, and via red, no, just keep re-signing all the A's forever. That will help things. Yep. Uh, Maddie, who elects a team captain? The coach, GM, players? Uh, it's it's different in different situations. Usually the players will, will go ahead and name somebody. Sometimes the coach will. Um, you know, other times, I mean, what was the Messier situation all the way back with the Canucks where he, like, demanded it as part of... <laughs> signing there yeah you see all different types of situations but usually the players are the most involved yeah i i, I always think of it and usually as a as a player-based thing um i i'm being given a, a question here i don't know if it's from further in chat but I'm, I'm being texted this and um did they not do the hoist the colors again to start the third i don't think they did and they didn't do it last home game either that's something that we've noticed i don't know i've never really been a fan of it uh certainly not when you're trailing by a lot going into the third i don't know i regardless i've never been a fan of it so uh, if they're stopping it i don't mind right but it's 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 one of those like it makes you question why now of all times would they stop that yeah well i mean you know the game the game ops team right they, they do experiment yeah. with different things they add That's things true. they take things away they do look at the data and what people like and don't like so maybe they're just trying out not doing it yeah um, let's see, is our best approach to just clear the board and give our young talent all the chances to succeed next season like some other bottom feeders do from Riley? I think if you're going for a longer term approach, possibly, but I don't think the Kraken or, or Ron Francis is in a situation where he can afford to do that and expect to keep his job. So I don't think we'll see something like that because if you do that, you're looking at this is a year five or year six team rather than, mm -hmm. you know, year four, year five team. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Viren, RJ, did you ever figure out the winning streak, losing streak question? I did not, uh, because things got kind of busier toward the end of the games. I was prepping for everything, but I plan on looking that up afterward. Thank you so much for your help, uh, Viren, by the way. Um, yeah, always the MVP for that kind of stuff, but I will go look it up. Yeah, care to let what? everybody know what the question was? Oh, so the question was, I was curious, are the Kraken the first team in NHL history to have a nine-game win streak or nine or more game win streak and two eight or more game losing streaks in the same season? Mm -hmm. I feel like that probably wouldn't have happened at any point previously, <laughs> but maybe it has. And if it has, I'd like to know when. Yeah. Um, Brooke, they haven't, uh, they didn't do hoist the colors uh, tonight. Um, so there, there's confirmation on that. And then uh, Fuzzbox Barbecue, been jumping in and out of this because of the toddler. But did you all hear GM Ron Francis's interview during the second intermission? He was very transparent about Maddie. And so I know you wouldn't have RJ, um, right. but I did. I, I did listen to that. And he talked about about Maddie and, you know, the, the struggles he's gone through and the fact that, you know, last year he had that long stretch where he wasn't scoring this year. It happened to be at the start of the season and, and how much um, pressure he puts on himself for not contributing and helping the team win and that he's one of those guys and that it's it's something that a lot of professional athletes do. And it's one of those things that you learn as you play to um try to limit it or try to use that and channel it in ways that's going to help you then produce on the ice, right? Don't just beat yourself up, use it as motivation if you're going to kind of thing. Right. And that, um, you know, Maddie's just a young guy and he's still learning things like that, but that his desire is there for the team to win. And when the team's not winning, he takes it personally. So, you know, that's, that's and, some of what I was talking about. Yeah. And also we talked earlier about, Maddie, the idea of him just kind of taking control of the room over the vets and be like, look, I'm not going to be a loser. <laughs> you know, we all need to work harder. It's harder to do when you're having such a down season. It's a lot easier when you are one of the guys who's driving the bus from a production standpoint. I'm sure, especially being a younger guy, having a down season, you might not feel like your message will have enough weight given the context. Yeah. And I, I think that that's probably where they were at. And, um, with everybody still being around for next year, I don't know that that'll entirely change. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how it changes, and we'll see what the potential addition of Shane Wright or the expected addition of Shane Wright will also add into that. Because then maybe it becomes: is there a strength in numbers approach for the young guys? Right? Shane Wright has captained a Team Canada to a World Junior Championship. You know, right? Like he is the guy in with the firebirds right now like that's that's what i was talking about earlier before you joined rj is he is the guy down there like he is the guy running warm-ups he is the guy doing everything he is very comfortable in that role i do wonder if if maybe then that also changes the dynamics maybe if both of them are there together and and they can then kind of start doing things in tandem a little bit if they get on the same page yeah, and we've seen that dynamic from other teams, too. I remember with the Sharks growing up, they had a bunch of guys who came up through their AHL team together. They were friends from that. And once they got to the NHL, they kind of had a big enough leadership block to really, you know, I don't want to say compete, but really, you know, have their own voice, even amid the Thorntons and the Marlows. You had Couture's hurdles, even like, you know, Wingles, Demers, all those depth right. pieces who all grew up playing together in the AHL. And once they get to the NHL, I mean, you see it a little bit, even with like guys like Ty Cartier coming up, you know, Riker Evans, like they're all still buddies and they kind of have that little block in the room. If it gets bigger, I think then you could see, you know, Joey Decord's part of that. You could see right. that become more influential from the leadership perspective. It is interesting. It would definitely be interesting. And um, it's, uh, you know, I don't know that I would expect it right away from Shane Wright it coming in. Time. He's going to have, he's going to have yeah. a lot of other things on his plate uh, being a full-time NHL -er and all of that kind of stuff there. Um, but I, I do think that that might be a, a long-term thing that we might see um, from them. And then uh, I, I think we should end it on this one from Kyle here. I think what we're failing to acknowledge is that Sprong was clearly the glue guy who drove the team's effort level. You know, there was some conversation about the fourth liners up in the, the press bridge with my buddies there and just talking about which one, if you could only pick one to bring back. Mm -hmm. And I think we all had a separate player. I know you, you're a big believer in Ryan Donato, that he would yep. have been the guy. After seeing the effort in this game, I'm, I'm coming over to your side on the Donato train because you know what? He wouldn't give up. He, he would be working his butt off and going to the net. And I feel like everybody else would be embarrassed just watching him doing his thing mm -hmm. to the point where they'd have to go step up and do something more. 
I think every team needs one of those guys. Like that is they, those yeah. guys are so valuable because when you are a professional athlete, there's a certain level of ego that goes into that. And if you if you've got this guy out there skating his butt off game after game, you can't go too many games in a row without doing that yourself, without really feeling like, oh God, he's making me look bad. I can't let that happen. Yeah. Also, I like Daniel Sprong. I, I do miss covering him. So I didn't mean to just uh, move yeah. it from Sprong to Donato on that question, but uh, yeah, a any of those guys could help. Yeah, definitely. So thanks, Kyle, for, for this is a good question and uh, yeah. it helped make us smile here at the end. I want to thank everybody for joining us because we had a ton of people in here tonight. Um, everybody's super engaged. I want to thank everybody for also, you know, be having it be productive, right? Like we're all helping each other out like we always do. It's not just ragging on the team. Everybody's exploring for options. Everybody's looking for ways out of it and how can we get better? What changes need to be made so that we can move forward, right? It's not just a, a wallowing in this is bad and we're not turning into like a uh, certain com uh, Canadian markets where it would just be let's rag on like this one individual and make it all that one person's fault and never bring up a solution to the problem. Um, so I just want to thank everybody for the really kind of productive post game here and for everybody being on board and definitely for everybody who gave the super chats in this one. That is very, very appreciated. Of course, want to thank Flatstick Pub as always for sponsoring these post game lives one more time with the graphic here for that watch party at the South Lake Union location on April 5th. I'm super, super pumped. It'll be our it'll be our third time seeing the Ducks in the next two weeks, RJ. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> That's the most important part of these next two games. It's it's the warm up for yeah, the watch party I'm, game. That's right. That's right. And look, there is no better time for the Kraken to kind of pull, pull one out now, right? Not only are you facing Anaheim, but Coach Hackstall got fiery. He did it. He did the thing that so many people have been asking for for a long time. So I'm that really helped energize me, RJ. I'm like actually excited for this next Kraken game, and it's been a while since I've been able to honestly say that. Me too. I cannot wait to be back here in a couple days and see what happens. Definitely. And I can't wait to see everybody here on Post Game Live after the game as well. But until then, we will see you all next time.